Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for this edition of Chelsea Green's uh, Practical Skill Sharing webinar series. Today, we're, we're happy to have Jesse Frost, who is the author of the Living Soil Handbook, the No-Till Grower's Guide to Ecological Market Gardening, which will be released very soon in the next few weeks. I just have, I'm Michael Weaver with Chelsea Green Publishing, and I have just a couple of announcements to make at the top here by way of housekeeping. The, uh, Jesse's gonna talk for roughly 30 minutes or so, at which point we'll have some time for question and answers at the end. We'll keep the whole thing to, to no more than an hour. So we'll be done by the top of the hour. Um, and please, if you, if you have questions, if questions occur to you as Jesse's talking, please uh, use the question and answer box uh, at the bottom of the screen to post those rather than the chat. If you put them in the, we'll be, we'll be looking at the Q&A box to pull the questions and we will try to get to as many as we can uh, after the presentation's over in the second half. Uh, this is being recorded, this presentation, and there will be a re replay available on the Chelsea Green YouTube channel probably by early next week. And anyone who's registered and any attendees will be receiving a link to the recording. So you don't need to worry about it. You should get that information sent to you. I'll just, I want to just call your attention before I introduce Jesse, just call your attention to the chat area where there is or should be a link to where to buy his new book or pre-order his new book at this point. Uh, and you, you should see that in the chat. And I would encourage you to do that if you, if you are so moved. And just a, a quick introduction for Jesse. Uh, Jesse and his wife, Hannah Crabtree, own and operate Rough Draft Farmstead, which is a no-till organic farm in central Kentucky. They raise mixed vegetables for restaurants and a CSA and for the farmer's market and at least in Lexington, Kentucky. And Jesse will be talking more about his methods, but I think it's safe to say that he's an innovator and someone with a lot of curiosity about the best ways to farm, especially no-till. Um, his farming draws from permaculture and biodynamics and Korean natural farming and Fukuoka style agriculture. Jesse's also the host of the No-Till Market Garden podcast and he's a co-founder of notillgrowers.com, where he helps to collect the most current insights and best practices on no-till growing from grower growers in North America, as well as the UK and Europe. So it's great to have you here, Jesse. Thanks for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. This is, uh, this is so great, and thank you to everyone at Chelsea Green. I'm going to quickly share my screen here. Um, where did it go? Where did you go? There we are and get this going. So um, today we're going to talk about why living soil is important. Obviously, we named the uh, my new book, The Living Soil Handbook, and we went back and forth about what to call it, but we were really set on that idea because the living soil is so incredibly important to what we do as growers. Um, and I want to be specific today in why living soil is important, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, you know, we're going to talk about several different things, uh, how soil works on a basic level, right? We can't cover that entirely in 30 minutes, but I will do some version of that. Um, photosynthesis is extremely important to, uh, you know, what we do and managing photosynthesis. So I'm going to talk, you know, give a little bit of a description of photosynthesis and kind of just the basics of how it works. Um, I think that's really important as a grower to understand photosynthesis, just in terms of knowing what's going right with your plants and also knowing what's going wrong and, and just the basic science behind it. Um, why plants are dependent on living organisms. Uh, I think this is incredibly critical. We, you know, we hear about it a little bit, but I want to kind of go a little bit more in depth on why we depend on living organisms for plants to succeed and what we as growers can do to assist in that relationship between plants and living organisms. So um, first, let's start with talking a little bit about how soil works or how specifically living soil works. And this really comes down to analogies. Uh, what I would love for everyone to take away from this who, who is not you know, really well versed in something like photosynthesis is to go take away from it something they can use to build on. So I, that's why I love analogies. I think analogies are really important just for communication. Um, I make several analogies in the book, but in this case, I'm going to make uh, an analogy I didn't make in the book so that you can 
add that to the one that is in the living soil handbook. Um, and that is that the soil acts much like a giant battery. And what I mean is that, you know, you have your solar panels, um, every battery needs a way to charge itself. So in this case, uh, the solar, the plant is charging itself through solar uh, power. And that would be uh, through the leaves. We have different shapes and sizes, different flavors. Uh, and some of them are very delicious. Some of them I don't necessarily recommend. Uh, but these are, you know, spinach, lettuce here. This is the way that the plant that the soil that the soil is taking in energy is through the plants um it is using this is where we're going to start talking about photosynthesis but this is the key is the so many cool things happen in plants this is where the chloroplasts are this is where the uh, photosynthesis really takes place so we have the solar panels we also need some infrastructure right plants you know for batteries to work they need wires and tubes and all sorts of things to transport the energy back and forth. And um, we have that in the soil. We have roots and mycorrhizal fungi, and we have stems to uh, you know, draw water up from the soil and take it to the leaves and nutrients and et cetera. Uh, these are really important parts of the soil battery. And we have to take care of those. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, Next is the battery itself. Now the soil isn't the battery really. I mean, the soil is really the casing because uh, it's not, you know, we all know that soil is ground up rock. It isn't necessarily where the, where the energy from the sun is being kept. The energy from the sun is being kept in things like fungi, in things like bacteria that gather around the roots and different microorganisms uh, such as microarthropods or um, nematodes, earthworms, and, but also, and I think this is an extraordinarily important point. Every living organism on the planet is part of the soil battery, including this goofy guy here. And so I want to take, let's follow some energy and just some solar energy when it add going into the battery and what that looks like. Um, so we have some leaves, right? These are soybeans in a tray, but this is where these are solar panels and solar panels take in carbon dioxide, sunlight, and water. They mix that together in a way that we'll describe in a minute, and they put it down through their roots and different microorganisms feed on them. This is a, you know, this is a kale plant and it is covered in microorganisms, even though you can't see them, you can see their remnants. You can see where they've aggregated soil around the roots. Um, and those microorganisms are eaten by slightly larger microorganisms, like the microarthropod we mentioned a minute ago, uh, you know, various nematodes and uh, all sorts of fun little organisms that crawl around in the soil that we can't see. And then some that we can see eat those slightly larger ones. So earthworms and mites and uh, beetles and all sorts of bugs are eating those uh, organisms. So just so we're on the same page here, this energy has come in here so far, it has gone down to these, a little bit of it is transferred here, and then a little bit of it is transferred here. So what started here is now in an earthworm and maybe a chicken or a mole or something plucks it out of the soil. I like the chicken because this is where we get to us. What started out here is now here. Some small percentage, of course, there's some energy loss along the way, but some small percentage of what came in here and what was right here is now here. And that's, this is all about energy storage. This is all about the soil battery. The soil is not collecting energy and then just sticking it in the ground up rock. The soil is collecting energy and putting it in all sorts of different living organisms. And obviously what we're talking, and this is where the magic happens, right? This is what we're talking about is photosynthesis. And it is, an incredibly, I, I really want to take a second to just talk about how I think understanding the basics of photosynthesis makes you a better grower, being able to recognize when a plant is stunted and is not growing, what is enabling it to, what is, what is disabling it? What is, what is permit, uh, what is not allowing it to put on the leaf growth that it needs or the plant growth that it needs, or what is causing the chlorosis, making it yellow And a lot, almost all the time, 
in basically everything that isn't a disease, you realize that the issue is photosynthesis. And even in a disease, if it's not photosynthesizing well, it's not able to protect itself. Uh, the plant is not able to produce the food it needs. Um, so photosynthesis is really what it all comes down to. And you know, if the soil battery, if the soil is a battery, photosynthesis is is how we charge it. And so let's kind of break down this idea of photosynthesis and and a little bit about what goes into it. Um, we have a plant. This is a little baby broccoli plant. You're going to see this a lot in the next few minutes. Plants all need water. Uh, water is incredibly important nutrient for plants. So the Water is, uh, if for our purposes, water can be taken in through the leaves, but for our purposes, it's coming in through the roots, in through the stem, and then it's going into industrious little plant cells called chloroplasts. Now, chloroplasts are really incredible. Uh, they, they are where the magic happens. And by magic, I am talking specifically about photosynthesis because it's not magic, but it's kind of like magic. It is, these chloroplasts have all sorts of really interesting structures, but for our sake, what they do is they are, they are where the water lands and next, this is kind of the first step of the photosynthetic process. Also where the sunlight lands, the fun, sunlight is actually taken in by chlorophyll, which is made in the chloroplast. It's just a pigment. It's green. We know chlorophyll really well. Uh, every photosynthesizing plant has chlorophyll, even if it is a red plant. Uh, there's different kinds of pigments, but the uh, chlorophyll is the main pigment that takes in photo that takes on photons. And photons are essentially just energy, little energy balls from the sun. Uh, you know, they travel several million miles to get here and plants are ready for them. They use that energy from the sun to split these water molecules. Now this is incredibly interesting to me that the plant has figured out a way to split really difficult molecules like the H2O molecule um, to release some oxygen, which we get to breathe in, thankfully, is really exciting. Um, thanks, photosynthesis. They split the water molecule and release oxygen, and then they create two energy carrying molecules. We're not going to go too much into, but that's AD, ATP and NADPH. And that's, those are really important, but they're uh, a little bit beyond the scope of this. One thing that I want to do here though, is just say, this is when you come across, I'd like to encourage you to understand this next process, because if you understand this process and the next one, you can start diving into uh, scientific papers about photosynthesis and start understanding how the plant takes in these different nutrients, water and sunlight and carbon dioxide. Um, and if you understand this basic form, you can start reading those, those abstracts and those introductions to these papers starts to make a lot more sense. And you're able to get a lot more out of the scientific papers if you just understand this basic process. Uh, so the next step is carbon dioxide. Uh, this is the, you know, what we, you know, obviously carbon dioxide has, is kind of the most popular of the things going on here, but it actually is the uh, what we call photos. This process is what we call photosystem one, the sunlight and breaking apart water molecules. This, when carbon dioxide enters the picture is what we call photosystem two, or it's actually called photo. Sorry, I reversed that. It's photosystem two is the sunlight and water. Photosystem one is the carbon dioxide, even though it happens second. But this is important because if you're looking through scientific papers, they'll say, they'll mention PS2 or photosystem two, and it's good to just know the difference. So PS2 is the water sunlight, PS1, Photosystem one is the carbon dioxide entering the picture. Um, and this is also really interesting because carbon dioxide enters the picture through the bottom side of the leaf. And I think that's something that needs to be pointed out for things that we're going to talk about in a little while, but also just for living soil, because the reason that the stoma, the stomata rather, that are taking in the carbon dioxide or on the underside of the leaf is because the majority of the carbon dioxide is coming out of the soil. So they are strategically placed to be able to easily take up and uh, utilize the carbon dioxide. So effectively you have the energy carrying molecules. Now the oxygen is left, the it's mixing with some carbon dioxide and some nutrients and et cetera. And what you get is glucose. This is G3P, it's glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or glucose. And it is the most, uh, it's the building block of all life. Um, we need this process here, photosynthesis, where water is being broken apart by sunlight and make that product, the end product of that is being mixed with carbon dioxide. And the end product of all of that is glucose. We need that um, 
to make plant leaves, right? The, some of the glucose is used to, for the structure of the plant. Some of the glucose is used to be put into the soil through the roots that we're going to talk about. Um, and every living organism on the earth is dependent on photosynthesis. It's all dependent on this process, right? So plants obviously are dependent on this process to create their structure. Um, I'm really fond of the squash plant. I think it's really pretty. The Turkey. I'm really fond of this photo. He is a, uh, he was our neighbor's Turkey and he just roamed around. I liked him a lot and he is also dependent on photosynthesis. So is the chicken that laid the egg or the, you know, the beef that, that is, comes from cattle that were grazing on the grass. That is all dependent on photosynthesis. It is all part of the soil battery. And I also want to emphasize here that every photosynthesizing plant is dependent on living organisms. So it's not just the living organisms being dependent on photosynthesis, but it's the photosynthesizing plants that are dependent on living organisms. This is my current farm. There is a lot of photosynthesis here. We leave living pathways. We leave, uh, we have, you know, we keep plants in the ground at all times. Uh, we are constantly flipping beds the second they're out of production. Well, not the second, that's a little bit, that's a, that's a little bit uh, uh, braggadocious. We definitely wait a couple of days sometimes, but primarily we try and get the plants in the ground absolutely as fast as we can. So the next step, the next portion of this talk, uh, will focus on ways in which the plants need soil that is rich with life to thrive. Um, so, Remember how I, you will remember how I said that plants were making glucose, uh, here. And like I said, you're going to see this guy a lot. Um, it varies based on the plant and the stage of growth, but plants don't just use all the glucose they create to generate plant tissues. Like I said, they're not just creating that. They're not just, you know, photosynthesizing for themselves. It's not just about the roots and the stems and the leaves and all of the, and the fruit. Um, they share it with the soil and, there's a lot of reasons and ways that they do this, but the one of the you know most well known and and some of you certainly will be familiar with uh, is root exudates. These are carbonaceous snacks that the the plant is feeding to the soil, to the soil life, to uh, bacteria and fungi. This is actually purple metal, which I think is fun because they uh, I've always suspected this is really good for soil. You can't see the plant up there, but it's that obnoxious winter weed that you get. Um, but I, every time I pull one up, I just get this really amazing soil aggregated, uh, rhizosheath of sorts here on the, uh, roots. So anyway, the roots are covered in that because microbes are gathering around to absorb as many of those exudates as they can. So that is enriching the soil with the carbon from the atmosphere and the uh, water and sunlight. But with exudates that are exudates are interesting. They're, they're full of, um, you know, fatty acids, amino acids, uh, hormones, uh, just a bunch of different compounds. And they're used for different things by the plant. The plant can use um, exudates to, for instance, uh, you know, ward off other plants. Uh, it can draw in specific microbes that it wants for specific nutrients. Um, they are, uh, you know, the, this is a really good example of uh, exudate usage that is not directly feeding itself, but is kind of protecting itself. So they, um, you know, this is the rye plant. The rye plant is famous for its allelopathic effect. And that is an exudate. That is the effect of photosynthesis. They're able to create a, a, uh, chemical that is able to prevent weed germination and pretend, uh, prevent the growth of other, of other, uh, competitors. And that's comes from sunlight and water and carbon dioxide and a bunch of different uh, nutrients. And this is the work of microbes eating exudates. They gather around that, those roots and they protect them. They hold in moisture. They, um, they do a lot to keep this coming. Cause this is like, I mean, if you're a microbe, finding a root is just the, you know, that has got to be the most exciting thing in the world. Um, and you know, this is just a, a, an enormous food source for them. And then when it, when the plant dies, it becomes even more of a resource. It becomes more of a, a, uh, product of, you know, uh, carbon where they, of soil organic matter that they can consume and release the nutrients that are trapped in the roots. So, you know, roots are really, uh, it, it, it really excellent for, for microbes. And those exudates are a big part of that, um, of that 
interest for the for the microbes. So next we have the rhizosheath, and, and this isn't next, I guess. I talked about this a second ago, but uh, I love the rhizosheath. I think this is a really cool uh, faction or a really uh, interesting thing that happens in nature. This is a beet, um, and these are uh, once again the microbes have gathered nutrients or gathered soil. Uh, it looks like a lot of mulch, but a lot of stuff around the roots. And one of the one of the reasons I wanted to point this out is you know the rhizobium bacteria. Um, this is the nodule off of legume a legume plant, uh, specifically an Austrian winter pea. And rhizobium back uh, rhizobium bacteria they actually uh, are kind of invited inside of this little structure that the pea plant makes or that many legumes make, and um, they sequester or they affix nitrogen in there. And what this is why I think this is really interesting is that um, you know, the plant kind of creates this for the rhizobium because nitrogen fixation is actually really difficult and really uh, energy intensive process. And it also requires a, uh, you know, an amount of oxygen, like a regulated amount of oxygen on the part of the bacteria. So they need to be able to relate to regulate their oxygen better. Um, and that's kind of what's happening here is that you have bacteria that are feeding on the roots and they're regulating oxygen to an extent with all of this soil uh, aggregate around the, the roots and what that's doing is it allows them to regulate oxygen so they can fix nitrogen and also you know there's a lot of different ways that that they're that these microbes are getting and giving nutrients um so once again photosynthesizing and they're gaining uh a lot of different uh, they're creating a lot of different uh exudates out of the glucose and it's coming down into the soil and the little bacteria or whatever are eating it. And then maybe this testate and amoeba consumes them. And when it poops it out, they are releasing all the nutrients that was in that microbe. Um, big shout out to Troy Hinkey of Living Roots Compost Tea. He worked on a compost uh, that's a recipe that's actually in the book, an inoculating compost that's rich with microbial life. And this was the one of the uh, photos that he sent me from that, from that project that we did together. Um, he was kind of consulting with me to, to help me get my compost uh, as, microbial, as microbially rich as possible because you want obviously a lot of a diversity of microbes to have good, healthy soil. Um, but anyway, yeah, they're, they're these larger microorganisms, the microarthropods and all those are eating the smaller organisms and any nutrients that are contained in them comes out when the, uh, either this one dies or when they uh, poop it out. And so that is a, you know, one way in which they leave uh, nutrients in the soil for the plant to gather. And of course, what we're talking about here is the um, soil food web. And this is a, the illustration by my wife, Hannah Crabtree. And this is also in the book, um, but this is also popularized quite a bit by um, uh, Elaine Ingham. Dr. Elaine Ingham is the one that really popularized this. So this is really just about um, plants photosynthesizing, bringing exudates into the soil, bacteria, fungi, et cetera, are consuming those exudates. And then larger things are consuming those smaller organisms and they're relieving those microbes or those nutrients in the soil and uh, for the plant in a plant available form. So uh, I don't remember why I stuck this one back in there, but it's good to look at it again. The other thing about the uh, soil food web is that it's not the only way plants gain their nutrition. Um, you know, we have, for instance, some sort of really interesting things that we're discovering more and more lately. This is coming out of Rutgers. Uh, John Kemp did a really good interview with uh, one of the main people that's involved at the right with studying rhizophagy cycle. Um, and the idea here is that plants are absorbing bacteria through their roots and the bacteria are a, and essentially once they're inside of the root meristem, the, the growing tip of the plant, the bacteria are actually releasing some of the nutrients that they contain. And then they are um, being spit back out of the root to gather more nutrients. Um, and this is really important too. One way that I didn't mention this, maybe why I had that other slide in there was just to mention that, you know, bacteria and fungi are able to use enzymes. Enzymes are kind of catalysts and they're able to use specialized enzymes to release nutrients from rock particles. That's really important because plants can't necessarily do that. That is a really specialized trick that, that microbes can do. Um, 
And what that does is they release it from the rock particle and then they absorb it. And so the bacteria, perhaps called in by the exudate, by the plant decided it needed some magnesium or something. The back, that bacteria goes and fetches that magnesium and it comes back and then it dies and it releases the magnesium in a plant available form. Or in this case, the plant absorbs it through the rhizophagy cycle and it, and it releases that magnesium for the plant to be able to utilize. Um, so that's one additional way in which plants are capable of, you know, or how plants get their nutrients. Uh, also mycorrhizal fungi, uh, they reach deep into the soil to do that same thing where they're gaining actually rise of mycorrhizal fungi are really interesting on many different levels. Uh, so they do the enzymatic, you know, activity of, of breaking up soil particles and that sort of thing. There are also mycorrhizal fungi that kind of, uh, vacillate between, being saprophytic. So the type of fungi that actually break down woody things, some, some mycorrhizal fungi can even do that. So they're, uh, they're really extraordinary organisms, um, but they can reach into the soil, deep into the soil, deeper than much, far deeper than roots to gain those nutrients for the plants. And then they, they trade them for, uh, exudates because exudates are apparently delicious. And then we also, you know, plants may have also absorbed some organic nitrogen, like um, through amino acids, but also some proteins and peptides. This is uh, really interesting because I think for a long time, agronomy looked at plants as these things that really relied almost exclusively on organisms to get their nutrients. Um, and this, you know, there's been a lot of research over the last decade or so that that has shown um, there's an increasing amount of in research that I've seen that is showing just how accessible or how plants can actually use organic and not just inorganic forms of nitrogen, which is really just fascinating. Um, it, it basically just throws that whole idea of plants relying on other organisms to eat and, and out the, out the window, um, you know, the heterotroph autotroph idea. And so anyway, that that's, I think is really fascinating. Um, and I talk about much of this stuff in the book. Uh, I go into some things more in more detail than others, but um, you know, what I'm largely talking about with nutrients, a lot of nutrients get cycled through soil organic matter, right? When something dies, it's nutrients are often contained in that. So these, these get cycled through all these other organisms and through, uh, in made available for plants to consume. So the more of this you have, the better off your plants are and the better they are able to access the nutrients that they need. Um, that is only one small benefit of, you know, organic matter. I they, they're just, they, Soil organic matter for quick aside is uh, incredible for a lot of reasons in the soil. It's able to move water through really quickly. It is also able to hold water when when it's in drier times. Um, it, you know, many of the plant nutrients, many of the nutrients that plants need comes works through so soil organic matter. So the more soil organic matter that you can possess, the better. Um, uh, to a, to an extent, I mean, there is a point at which there's so much soil organic matter, it's, it's, you know, unable to, uh, you know, grow plants, but I think, you know, successfully, but I think there is, you know, generally that if you can get up to that eight to 12%, then you're, then you're really rocking. That's, uh, you basically will have almost everything you need for your plants. Um, but anyway, let's move on to something else. I want specifically, well, very related carbon dioxide. Um, carbon dioxide is, we think about carbon dioxide being really present in the atmosphere. We hear a lot about it in, in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, global warming and, and climate change. Um, but for plants, they are really, they need a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, it's because of this industrious little enzyme called Rubisco that um, is, is uh, not as efficient these days, which is a whole story I kind of tell in the book, but is what, is the catalyst for carbon dioxide to be turned into glucose. But anyway, the carbon dioxide, it is, oops, its main thing is coming out of, you know, it's going into the plant through the bottom sides um, and it's coming out of the soil. And the reason it's coming out of the soil, the reason that we have all this carbon dioxide being kind of entering the picture coming up from the, from beneath is this, is this whole thing that we have going on down here. So, bacteria are being consumed by microarthropods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when they're consumed, some of their nutrient is left behind, right? But then a lot of their carbon is leaving the soil in the form of carbon uh, dioxide. And that's becoming accessible to the plants, right? This is the, this is another illustration by my wife, Hannah, that's in the book. And this is, um, 
you know, we have a bunch of soil organisms that are living and dying and releasing carbon and carbon dioxide is coming underneath of the plant and the plant is reabsorbing it and putting it back into the soil. It's called the carbon cycle. Uh, it's, you know, important for all plant life and all plant life is important for us. But the, the, you know, the thing that I want to say about like carbon is that there's, you know, plants are using it to build their, so their, build their structure. Um, carbon dioxide is in, you know, it's coming up out of the soil. Um, but we need a cycle of it right here. We need as many organisms as we possibly can fit that make sense under the soil, living and dying at all times. Cause that's where soil respiration is going to come in. We also need to think about how can the carbon dioxide leave the soil? If the surface is super compacted, then it's, a gas exchange is not going to be as uh, readily available, right? The gas is going to be stopped at the surface and not be able to escape as quite as well as we need it to. So like I said, you need a lot of organisms to create adequate CO2 and you also need to manage the photosynthetic process, right? This is what I want to talk about next. Where do we as humans farmers come into the picture? Um, here is our job. Our job is to steward photosynthesis, steward photosynthesis. This is really what my book is about, is stewarding photosynthesis. It's making sure that the water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide are all, uh, you know, uh, tended to and making sure that the plant has what it needs. And we do that by following these three basic principles or these, well, I actually tack on a few, but we'll say the three basic principles that I kind of designed the book around or keep the soil covered as much as possible. These are, um, these are the conservation agriculture principles that I read several years ago, keep the soil covered as much as possible, planted as much as possible and disturbed as little as possible. I read these several years ago. And one of the things that always has bothered me about that was when I was reading these probably over a decade ago, um, I would flip to the section of the book or the pamphlet or whatever it was where they tell you, you know, give you the technical details and there just wasn't enough there. So that's really what I try and do in this book is give the, you know, the technical details for how to do all these things. So the first of those conservation agriculture principles is keep the soil covered as much as possible. We use various mulches in this, in this one, I'm doing a very dramatic drop of compost. Like nobody does that. Nobody does that that high, but I'm doing, you know, we do a lot of compost mulching. We do a lot of, uh, I actually use hay in certain instances. Um, and we also use cover crops to do mulching and, and I would use others if they were more readily available. So uh, wood chips and and uh, car any carbon waste that is not going to necessarily add a bunch of weed seed or cause herbicide issues. Um, it's extremely important, and I I dedicate a whole um, you know section to mulch. Also, keep it planted as much as possible. This is this is something like I look at my hands here, planting, putting a photosynthesizing plant into bare soil or into un photosynthesizing soil, at least in this case. And that to me is amazing that I'm, that that's something that nature can't necessarily do as easily as we can, that most organisms are not planting a seed. They're, most organisms are planting a seed. We're planting a plant and we're plant, we're immediately getting that soil photosynthesizing and keeping it photosynthesizing. And I think that's an incredible ability of the, of the growers. Um, you know, and you want to do wide diversity of plants in there. And in this case, I have the living pathways, have several different grasses and clovers and et cetera, uh, onions, lettuce, different kinds of lettuce, beets, uh, there's radishes and all sorts of stuff over here, garlic, carrots, peppers. I mean, just as many different plants. And I do a lot of interplanting. Um, this is kind of a lazy interplant, but this is one of the things that I talk about in the book is all the different ways you can interplant, um, different strategies, some more of the complex strategies, um, and then some basic ones, some entry level stuff, just planting radishes below your tomatoes, for instance. Um, but then more complex ideas and ways to kind of figure out what interplants work for you based on their, their production. And also just based on what we know about certain plants interactions with other plants, um, and disturb the soil as little as you possibly can in your context. And there's a lot of as possible in here because that's really important. Uh, you cannot be dogmatic about these things. The what soil, what plants need to photosynthesize where you are is the same as what they need in my place. But what your soil looks like and how it's going to perform once you get plants in it is not the same. Um, so that is where you have to figure out what amount of disturbance is important for you, uh, for those plants, and think more about 
directing the photosynthesis than kind of, you know, what is tillage and what is not tillage? Like, what are you doing to keep the soil covered as much as possible and planted as much as possible and disturbed as little as you can? So in this case, um, you can't see it as well from this angle, but I'm actually, um, these beds are raised and I had to raise these beds to get away from drainage issues. And I had to raise these beds to warm that soil a little bit. And this, and also beat up a little, you know, get through a little bit of compaction. So I have started raising a lot of beds on my property when I didn't before, because we're in a hot climate and I don't necessarily want beds that can get hot really quickly. Um, so I started raising the beds and the, you know, we put in these, this is just tomatoes and you know, the mixture of stuff, green onions, there's uh, basil and all sorts of different inner plants. But the, um, the idea here is that I had to do that. And for a little while, because of the density of my soil, the compaction areas, I will also have to broad fork to open it up. And the whole idea is to give that gas exchange for the carbon dioxide to be able to leave the soil and for the roots to move around. And slowly over time, as I, if I do that right, I won't have to do it for that long. So it's really about managing the photosynthesis and not thinking dogmatically about what is and is not tillage and what is and is not, you know, right for every grower. Cause it's not always the same. Um, and encourage life always, uh, in this circumstance, I'm, like I said, planting a lot of different plants. Transplants are really great for us. We use almost exclusively transplants except save for a few really fast germinating crops and carrots. Carrots are the one that we have to grow. Um, but we, you know, we keep, so we keep plants in the ground and we also use a lot of compost teas. Um, I don't spraying is actually not my preference. Um, but I, I actually inoculate every single tray that we use with vermicam vermicompost tea. So basically, or a slurry, really, I just make a, I just put a little vermicompost in some water and I let the tray soak before it goes out to the soil. So I'm immediately putting good beneficial organisms right into the soil the second I plant them and it's right at the rhizosphere. Um, that has been the easiest way for me. I like spraying in the spring when I have a little bit of time before the season really gets going. Uh, but once plants are producing, I don't spray as much in part too, just because I don't, you know, food safety, I like spraying stuff before it's going to be food anytime soon. So that's kind of my, um, you know, my take on that. And then got to keep the battery charged. We live in this, this is, there's only one in our, in our galaxy that we're aware of, and we don't know how many are out in the universe, but we have one. And if we don't take care of it, it turns to Mars. It would turns to dust and we have battery left and we can grow that battery. That's what regenerative agriculture is about is growing that battery and keeping filling in the spaces that are, that are not storing energy, that are not gaining energy. We can do that. We have that capability. We just have to readjust the way that we grow and put our minds to it and figure out different techniques in different areas. Um, you know, we see the West is hot and dry and we have to, you know, re-figure out what we're going to do about those areas and how we can keep the soil battery charged. And, and um, yeah, and I think, uh, I think maybe it's time for some questions. Great. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm not seeing myself. Okay. Thanks. That was great. And, uh, and we do have a few questions that we'll just, we can dive into with the time we have left. And just a reminder, if anyone else wants to ask questions, uh, please post them in the Q&A and we'll get to them. Um, so one question that came up is, and this is from Maria, along no-till lines, what's the best way of planting cover crops in an abandoned vineyard? I really don't want to brush hog or otherwise destroy everything. The field's covered with all kinds of invasives, like quote, in quote, invasives, like buckthorn, goldenrod, et cetera. The soil needs lots of improving. It's very hard pan right now. So look, someone looking for advice on what to do in that kind of a scenario from a note. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I get those kind of questions a lot from people that have compacted areas and they have, yeah, something invasives or something growing. Um, and you, you really are probably going to want to, uh, depending on how big that is. I mean, if you can, if it's, I mean, I'm assuming if it's a vineyard, that is probably quite a lot of acreage, um, or it's at least more than maybe like a couple tarps could cover. But, uh, the ideal is to actually, if it's really hard and it's really, you know, uh, depleted, it may be the best approach is to, um, you, you have two options. You can put down some really nice compost and you can work that into the soil and you can build your beds and then you never have to do it again, but you've, 
you know, given the soil a chance to breathe and to have that photo, that soil respiration it needs, um, and to get some photosynthesizing plants in there immediately, get those cover crops in there. Because I think, uh, you know, don't, it won't work if you try and just broadcast cover crops over top of that. You're going to have to open up the soil somehow. So that's one option. The, uh, the uh, other option is that you may have to put in, uh, put a tarp or something over top of it if it's small enough. Um, if it makes more sense, uh, tarps come with their own issues, but you can take like a black silage tarp, place that over top, let it basically, um, you know, uh, break those plants down, leave it there for as long as you can, especially if they're super invasive, that will help to break to knock them back. And then I would get something in it like rye this fall. Uh, rye is great for knocking back those invasives um, and especially grasses. And um, just depending on what it is, that would be very helpful to get a rye crop through uh, like those allelopathic effects we had, we had talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to get the soil opened up to really get, or the, you know, people may say like build over top of it, composting and that sort of stuff. But if you're talking about a lot of area, you're talking about a lot of compost. So you could look at the deep compost mulch system and see if that works in your system, uh, in your scenario, or, um, you know, look at no dig, uh, the Charles Dowding and Richard Perkins who've really championed that. Um, you could look at that too. I mean, that may be an option. I would still in that circumstance, think about doing broad forking or something before I put that down but you do want to open up that compaction because that will, uh, we've run into that scenario on our farm. It, it really uh, makes it really difficult to grow the plants, even with a bunch of compost over top, because those roots are going to want to get down there. And when they get down there and it's not breathing, they're not going to do well. Great. Kind of a, a quick follow-up to that. How do you feel about cardboard for sheet mulching? Uh, generally okay. As long as it doesn't contain a lot of colored inks. Um, I think, you know, you see the earthworms really love it. I think it's a good way to start a garden. And in our, in our climate, if you don't put a weed mat down before you put compost or wood chips or something, and even when you do, it's so hot and wet here that weeds just go through it. And cardboard has been one thing that does pretty well with that, um, that does help. Uh, if you can put some good compost right on top of the cardboard just to help break it down and, um, you know, kind of maybe remediate any issues that may be with the glues or whatever. Um, I generally, okay. I, there's part of me that feels like, you know, this is a really wasted resource. And if we can turn it into soil and put this carbon back in the soil instead of in our landfills, then yeah, maybe it's better. I mean, maybe we're doing, doing, you know, some, a bigger part. And I think that's important too. So. Yeah. Great. Uh, it's a different question from Anna Maria. Hello, I'm wondering how do you take care of IPM in your farm without hurting all of the organisms that you were talking about in your presentation? What's your strategy with pests and IPM? Yeah, I mean, you know, we do a lot of different stuff. Uh, we don't do any, I mean, we don't do any sprays. We don't use any, um, you know, uh, Bacillus therogensis even. We, we do some covers and that sort of stuff. But in terms of like, um, you know, our sort of strategy to pests is we grow diversely and we have things like birdhouses. Uh, we have things it, I, 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 I sometimes get ahead of myself because I know that we don't have things like moles and gophers and stuff that a lot of people out West have to deal with. Um, so that's a little bit different, but I think encouraging that life, you know, we, like I said, birdhouses, um, we have cats, they're kind of obnoxious, but you know, we have a couple cats that helps with, uh, rodents and, um, and then, you know, just encouraging life and lots of flowers and lots of, uh, you know, that bring in the beneficials and, um, you know, uh, one that we do a lot that, that we've been doing the last couple of years is the, uh, sweet alyssum under the tomato plants. Uh, to bring in the braconoid wasps. That's one that I got from Daniel Mays at Frith Farm, who also has an excellent book that I'd like to shout out. Um, but he, you know, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's been part of it. It's just flower and more flowers is, is a great option. Great. Thanks. Um, Kyle is asking, what is the best practice for introducing Korean natural farming practices? What's a good starting point or something to try if you want to if you want to explore. Yeah, I, I mean, I think lactic acid bacteria and then playing around with collecting some IMOs, some indigenous microorganisms is the place to start. Um, and then there's, you know, like also for information on that, I think Chris Trump has done great videos. They're, they're long and detailed and they're just just as so much information there. Um, and he's done a lot of podcast interviews and stuff too. So you can find, and he's done one for the no-till market garden podcast. Um, 
and then Shaddam, uh, there's great information in the, in that book, those books and the, um, uh, yeah, I think the, you know, the place to start is the basics, like just start with lactic acid bacteria is an easy one. Um, water soluble calcium. That's a good one, especially as we go into tomato season and may in pepper season, you may see some blossom end rot. In fact, I found a plant out there with some blossom end rot and I was thinking about getting some water soluble calcium and, um, maybe tried a couple other things and just seeing if I can get that to correct itself with foliar sprays. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's, those are great places to start. I think just, uh, read up on it first, like watch some of the videos and, and read some of the information that's out there. Cause there's, there's a lot out there now and it's great. I, I think Korean natural farming is incredible. And, um, yeah, I think that's got a lot of potential. Great. Thanks. Uh, one from Anjali. Thanks, Jesse. Very informative. Could you speak generally of the importance of carbon sinks and how they work? Yeah, so this is something that we think about. Uh, carbon sequestration in general is really kind of complex and it's a little bit misunderstood. And when we talk about carbon coming into the soil uh, in pho through photosynthesis, um, you know, I think people conflate that a lot of times with carbon sequestration because that's not necessarily what's happening, although it is happening to some extent. Um, you know, trees are going to be trees and living roots and big roots are your your, your best form of carbon capture. So, um, but generally like, uh, you know, there are also other carbon sinks like peat moss, but I mean, when we're talking about like, uh, like peat bogs, but when we're talking about like growing plants, um, a lot of carbon is coming in, but a lot is going out too. Um, and you can kind of think of it like a, I, I make the analogy of the, in the book, like a bank account where you have carbon coming in, um, and, uh, it's like money coming in, but you still have to use it. You still got to pay bills. But if you do, if you, you know, if your photosynthesis is high, if your business is going well, you're bringing in enough money that you can keep some in there. So that's the idea is you want to have such a robust photosynthetic uh, uh, process or, you know, plants are photosynthesizing really well to be able to save some of that. And they save it in many different forms, right? Like the, this volleying about, you know, it gets volleyed about from the bacterium to the microarthropod to the worm back to, you know, the worm dies and then it gets eaten by bacteria. And that's carbon just kind of being volleyed about to some small extent, some sliver of that original carbon just can, kind of stays in there. So it stays in that form. And then, you know, bacteria wrap it uh, up in aggregates sometimes, um, you know, so that there's like little, uh, little aggregates of carbon that just get, that stay in the soil. And I think that's always, when we talk about tillage, what we talk about is one of the things that happens when you till a soil really heavily and really repeatedly is you break up the soil aggregates. So the bacteria are, you know, bacteria and fungi are uh, encapsulating carbon. And then when you run a tiller through it, you're breaking up that, those, those aggregates, that, that encapsulation. And then oxygen loving bacteria are like, this is awesome. So they just start eating all that carbon. So you lose a lot of your carbon by doing that. Like if you want to keep it in there, you got to do all the things you got to keep it cut. You got to keep the soil covered. You got to, you know, keep it planted, you know, keep it photosynthesizing, keep pumping carbon in there. Um, and then you also just have to have a lot of soil life. And that's like I said, where the, you know, the vermicompost and all those things come in. Great. Thank you. A uh, question from Susan, uh, have Southern farmers embraced regenerative practices? And if not, why? What are the obstacles to that? Hmm. Um, I, I, you know, more and more, yeah. I think there are a lot of really great Southern growers, obviously. I think it's probably no lower or higher of a percentage than the rest of the country. Um, I think that the South is a really difficult place to grow. And when you're talking about weeds that will come through six or eight inches of, or 10 inches of, of, of wood chips, you're talking about a really big battle with those sorts of things that you can understand why Southern growers maybe lean on things like the tiller because of heavy clays. We have a lot of heavy clay in this, in the South, um, because of, yeah, things like really intense weed situations. Um, I think more and more, and I, I hope to see, you know, obviously there's lots of, uh, North Carolina is really rich with regenerative growers and, uh, South Carolina increasingly. So Tennessee as well. And, um, when Ray Tyler over there down in the South part of Tennessee, and I, I just think, I think it's growing. And I think, um, I think there's, there's a lot of potential for it for all the reasons we need more people growing their soil organic matter, um, to preserve more moisture and stuff, because we, we may have a lot of moisture here. We get 50 you know, to 70 inches of rain every year. Um, but we don't, you know, 
that doesn't necessarily mean we can squander it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's coming and it's growing. Yeah. Great. Ron has a question about those, uh, the living walkways and whether what, what kinds of plants you utilize in those. Do you specifically choose plants that benefit the crops in some way? I was curious about that too, whether you're actually planting those or just selecting for certain kinds of weeds that you want to do certain things. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I, I've actually done a couple of videos uh, in regards to living pathways on the No-Till Growers YouTube channel, so you can check those out for a for a more extended and visual um, uh, explanation. But the uh, let me see if I can find one of these photos real quick. But the um, so yeah, we don't use a lot of of um, uh, we don't try and put anything in there. Essentially, we over basically we leave whatever's there, whatever grasses are already there, um, and we over so and violets. Violets are a big fan of our farm. Um, we also over sow it with red and white clover, and the reason that we do it that way is not because I don't see potential in adding crops that are going to like benefit your soil. It's that what we found is nature in our climate and our context chooses. We don't really get that much say in it for very long. Um, we just have way too much moisture and way too much heat that stuff is going to germinate and it's going to compete. Um, so we've kind of just embraced it. And so you can though, I mean, there's certainly, I've heard, you know, I talked to Richard Perkins for the podcast in the last season and he spoke about people putting chamomile in their pathways. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. I don't think it would work here for very long. I think the grasses would, you know, take it over, but it could, I mean, it's not, I don't want to say you can't try it or shouldn't try it. Um, time time like creeping times um clovers obviously uh, uh a lot of potential i mean you could put i i love the diversity though there's so many different things in here and people are always asking about like keeping it out of the beds and what we do is essentially like when these onions come out and we do this a couple times in situ but for the most part it's like when the crop comes out. So when the crop comes out, we just run uh, a little hook hoe that comes from Haas tools that's what we've been using lately and that just breaks that those any of those rhizominous grasses so it's just like a edging um there's also edgers and stuff but a lot of times what we're, we're trying to find an option that isn't going to throw dirt into our lettuce mixes and stuff so because like i said like this crop is not going to come out at the exact same time as this crop in fact this crop did come out before this crop so to edge this with something that threw dirt it may throw dirt into our so that's you know those are little things that we're having to figure out and we're mowing it i'm sure somebody's going to ask we're mowing this with a, a 17 these are 18 inch pathways but we're mowing it with a 17 inch um uh electric mower and it's uh it's from greenworks and it's good but i i don't know that i'm going to necessarily say it's the right tool but it's it, it works for us and i can mow like 35 or 36 paths without it running out of battery so i can get through most of them um yeah great uh Kelly asks, Jesse somewhat alluded to this, but with flooding aside, how much moisture slash fungi is too much? When we see algae and fruit of fungi in fields, is that truly concerning or is it more indicative there's a healthy diversity in the soil? And thanks for the great info as well. Well, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, the, no, no, seeing fruiting fungi is not a bad thing. Um, how much is a bad thing could maybe depend on the crop. Some crops are not necessarily as fun as, uh, prefer as much fungi. Um, but I've not, I don't know that I've seen, I, I, I guess I've heard of people having issues with having just two fungally dominated soils. And in that case, you'd probably want to inject some air in there um, with maybe a broad forking or something. Like if it's a situation where you can't grow brassicas because you've just got way too much fun, fungal, uh, you know, populations in there or something. Um, I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe it's just a matter of slightly adjusting your strategy, uh, maybe a one-time broad forking and then just see if that improves things or adding compost that are more bacterially dominated um, to adjust for it. Or again, adding microbes onto the soil, onto the the plants that are going into those areas that are going to help to kind of, um, you know, uh, to, to change that, that, that that uh scenario for the in the soil um because it can shift and and you know if if the if the plant going in is not going to be feeding that fungi it's not necessarily going to be stay fungally dominated as long as the plant can survive long enough um yeah i mean it's very complex but yeah sure i think uh i, I don't think you have to worry about that though no fruiting fruiting fungi is is not a bad thing 
Great. We just have time for a couple more, and which is what we have as of now. So it's working out nicely. Uh, someone asked, uh, are there other surprising soil builders like the purple nettles that you mentioned that that you discuss in the book? And um, and actually during the during your presentation, Michalina asked whether that what was that weed that you showed that had the great kind of root structure? And I implied that I thought it was that purple nettle, but if, yeah, if sorry, that in case I was wrong, I'll let you. Uh, pick that someone else thought there was a rye that also had a really nice root structure in there. But what are the what are some weeds that or soil, you know, quote weeds that are that are soil builders that that you appreciate and uh, get? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the plant that I showed was the the one that you couldn't see the actual leaves on was purple nettle. Um, it's one that we get a lot in the winter here and it's it's great. It just, uh, I love the, what it does for soil. And I, I try and leave it in as long as I can. And then we take it out obviously because it'll go to seed in March. Um, but it has early flowers. The bees love it. It's just one of those weeds that I'm like, I don't know if this is, should count as a weed. It's just a soil builder. Um, chickweed's kind of that way too, with stuff that'll cover the soil in the winter time and be relatively easy to get rid of in the spring relatively. Um, I think those are great crops. Uh, another one that comes to mind is one that I spoke to Helen Atow about on, for the podcast is the uh, mallow. And she had, she had planted and she did living pathways. She did strip tillage and she did living pathways. And I think she'd originally planted her living pathways. I want to say this story is right. She'd originally planted her living pathways to um, clovers. And then that was kind of what ultimately took over. And she learned later on that it was a really good nitrogen gatherer. So um, yeah, I mean, any plant, any plant has potential. Uh, you know, even grasses, you know, they may make some mycorrhizal uh, connections and keep those going. So like in this situation with living pathways, you're putting this plant in and it's not that far from this living soil right here to be able to latch onto those, to that, to those benefits. Um, so that's kind of the idea for me is, is this isn't going to work in every scenario. Uh, I don't want to promote living pathways for people who live in really arid climates necessarily, because it could be, uh, a, you know, could use up a lot of your water, um, wood chips or something that's going to preserve water would be a better option. But in our climate where we just get a ridiculous amount of rain, um, they've been, they've been, they've worked out for us. Um, and I also suspect the same with, uh, uh, violets being good soil builders. Um, they're kind of obnoxious, but like they, you know, they're really low ground cover. They're they're and they, they're actually super deep. So, um, they don't seem to compete that much. They just kind of, you know, they're kind of in the way. Great. And this, and last one, I think this is someone else needing, wanting some advice Ramesh who asks in my, in my tunnel, I've used sawdust and horse manure. And in that place, whatever I plant, nothing grows there. So how can I fix that? Do I need to amend anything or clean the whole area and add some kind of mushroom compost? Any suggestions? Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of variables there. I mean, it depends on several different things, uh, what the quality of the soil is underneath, like how much wood uh, sawdust, like sawdust can suck up a lot of nitrogen. I mean, you'd need a lot of horse manure to counter that because you're talking about surface area with wood chips. There's not much surface area on a wood chip, but there is so much surface area on a lot of little, you know, uh, sawdust thing. So my, I mean, my first impulse is to say, maybe you don't have enough of the nitrogen element in there. So I would maybe think about trying at least some compost. Um, it depends on what's happening to the plants. I mean, if the plants are just not performing, if they're not growing, or if it looks they're yellowing, it could be a nitrogen uh, issue, nitrogen tie up. Um, it could also be compaction or depending on what the scenario is with your soil underneath. Um, and because compaction is something that we've, you know, I touched on that has to be addressed. Like you have to address your compaction because if the soil can't access the, you know, if the soil can't get water in there, right, compaction is going to stop water from penetrating. It's going to stop carbon dioxide from escaping. Um, that can be an issue too, but yeah, I mean, that, that would be my impulse to say sawdust can be kind of tricky. Great. Well, thanks very much. We are spot on the top of the hour. Um, thanks to everyone for your questions and for showing up and being, being here for this. And Jesse, thanks a lot to you for, for this. It was really great. Just a reminder to everyone that if, that all, all registrants should receive a link to this, which will be posted uh, after a little tidying up on the Chelsea Green uh, YouTube channel. And so you will get a link to that and it'll be available uh, sometime at sometime next week. It should show up there. So again, thanks everyone, uh, Jesse especially, and 
and we appreciate you being here and look forward to more of these kinds of things in the future. We'll keep absolutely. Thank yeah. Thank you all so much for coming.